Henry Kitten Tong. Good morning. Morning, everyone. Um, so you've got a presentation to, to rattle through. So do you want to sort of just sort of hand over to you and, and, and you can take us through? But tell us a bit about what the fund's doing, what it's trying to achieve, and how it's, how it's been doing recently, please. Oh, th thanks, James, and, and good morning, everyone. So my name is, is Henrik. I'm an investment director at, at Downing within the energy and infrastructure team. And with me here on the call, I got Tom Moore, who's the co-head of asset management. Um, over the following slides in our presentations here, we do have some important notices, and we appreciate if you could read those through after the conclusion of this, this presentation here. Um, but starting off with Downing LLP. Um, so Downing was founded over 35 years ago. Today we have uh, over one and a half billion pounds of equity under management. We made over 130 investments in, in core renewables. And we have over 180 staff in, in, in London and, uh, and Glasgow and Sweden. So we, we got a, a significant team which has much valuable experience in investing in, in renewable energy. We move on to the, the fund highlights that's coming in the next section here. So um, the, the fund in focus here for this presentation is Downing Renewables and, and Infrastructure Trust, or DOOR as we, we refer to it as. Um, some of the investment highlights of DOOR set out here on this slide and I'd like to, to just point you to that we are listed on the London Stock Exchange. We got a target NAV total return of six and a half to seven and a half percent with a 5p dividend. And, and as our core strategy here is diversification, and that's what we'll cover over the slides to come here. Um, if we move on to the next slide, um, the reason for, for pursuing a diversification strategy is, is twofold. It's firstly to increase the stability of the returns of the fund but also secondly, to broaden the pipeline of opportunities that we can pursue at any point in time. And that facilitates for us to find attractive acquisitions uh, throughout the cycles. If we look at the four pillars of diversification, what are they? They are technologies, the ge geographies, project stage, and revenue streams and markets. The reason why we have chosen this diversification strategy is that different technologies, they produce at different times as do investments in, in different geographies where, where the revenue drivers can, can differ. Um, also investing in, in different projects, they just means that we can invest in construction projects, for example, where we, we expect to achieve some incremental returns versus investing in operational assets. Um, on the next slide, we've set out the, the highlights of the fund since inception. So we were listed um, on the London Stock Exchange in December, mid-December 2020. And um, since then, we've deployed 140 million pounds uh, into, uh, into assets. And uh, that's effectively all the capital that, that we've raised since the inception. And we do also see a very strong pipeline in front of us. On the financial operational performance side, we've had a very strong year in 2021. Our generation was uh, up 5% versus the, the expectations and the operating profit was, was up 17%. The total return for the first year was, was strong. We achieved 7.9% um, return and we've moved to a 5p dividend per annum. In terms of the current macroeconomic climate that, that we operate in, um, that provides our fund with very strong economic tailwinds. The majority of our revenues are inflation linked, so high inflation is good for us. And the high power prices is also positive for, for a producer of, of energy. And importantly, in this context as well, we have locked in our interest rate exposure. Um, so that's, uh, that's the, the key highlights uh, since inception. Um, on the next slide, we have some of our um, ESG credentials. In 2021, uh, DOOR became an SFDR Article 9 compliant fund. That means that DOOR is a fund with a sustainable investment uh, objective and a reduction in carbon emissions um, objective. We do take ESG seriously. Uh, our annual average production from renewable energy sources is circa 355 gigawatt hours per annum. And that is equivalent to the annual 
electricity consumption of over 120,000 UK households. On top of this, we, we also have 247 acres of land that we manage and 106 million cubic meter of waterways that are managed by us. And put that in context, that is the equivalent to about 40,000 Olympic sized swimming pools. So that's a, that's a lot of water. And um, what does our portfolio consist of? Well, we in 2021, we made two acquisitions. And um, the first one we set out on this slide here is the UK solar portfolio. And that's a combination of ground mount rooftops. And we got a total of uh, over 3,000 uh, 3, installations. And uh, the portfolio as such has a very high level of fixed and inflation linked revenues. Um, the hydro portfolio, uh, we acquired eight hydropower plants from Fortum. They're located across South and Central Sweden. It's a diversified portfolio in terms of rivers and price zones. Each hydropower plant also has many decades of, of operational history. Um, so that's what we uh, owned at, at year end. Um, we're moving on to the next slide. We've set out the, the leverage position, the, the debt and the credit facilities. At year end, we were just below 30% levered. Um, and all of that debt was attributable to, to the solar assets. Since then, we have drawn down on the debt facility at Downing Hydro AB. This was a facility we established in the fourth quarter of 2021, but the, the first drawdown was in January 2022, and the, the purpose of this drawdown was to finance two further hydro acquisitions in, in Sweden. At the fund level, we've established a 25 million pound uh, RCF. The purpose of this fund, uh, the, this facility is, is to use it to finance acquisitions ahead of a future capital raise. On the next slide, we've set out a, a map of the assets that, um, that we own. The circles on this slide, they represent the 2021 hydro and solar assets. And the triangles, they, they represent the acquisitions we made in 2022. And these are additional hydropower plants in, in new waterways. And excitingly as well, we have made our first wind park acquisition, adding a new technology to, to our diversification strategy. So very pleased to have had a, a very busy start to, to 2022. Um, moving on to the next slide here. Um, in, um, in, um, so, uh, Sorry, in January, we acquired two hydropower plants. That was the total consideration for 25 million pounds. Uh, first acquisition was five power plants uh, with storage capacity in SE3. SC, and that's uh, Sweden is divided into different price zones. And that was a 12 gigawatt hour portfolio we acquired. We also, um, within a week, announced the acquisition of uh, four run of river plants in SE2, total annual average generation there of 36 gigawatt hours. These are recently refurbished hydropower plants, so there's minimal uh, capex requirements in the medium to long term. So what these two transactions have done, it's taken our hydro portfolio from a, an annual average production of 108 gigawatt hours up to 157 gigawatt hours, so a sub substantial increase to the portfolio. We move on to the next uh, slide here. Soon after the hydro transactions were announced, we, we, we also announced our first wind acquisition. We spent about 20 million pounds for 108 gigawatt hours wind farm in, in Northern Sweden. This wind farm has 20 turbines, about 10 years of operational history. Uh, and what's really exciting, of course, for the fund here is it provides the door with further technology diversification. And that diversification really comes out on this slide here. If you look on the right hand side in terms of generation, we now have 44% hydro, 31% wind and 25% solar. So very attractive mix. I think very few, few other funds can, can match. Um, having made these acquisitions at the start of the year, it also means we have minimal cash le left. And that's what you can see on the, uh, on the left hand side here with about 5% uh, of NAV left in, in cash in the fund. So we, we are more, uh, more or less fully invested, which, which, uh, which is exciting. On the next slide, um, looking forward, our pipeline, it remains very strong. We have over 200 million of, of pipeline opportunities now being progressed. 
uh, on a bilateral or an exclusive basis. And this is across the, the spectrum of asset classes that, that we invest in. And we have more hydropower facilities in, in new rivers and, and price zones. We have UK operational assets with a high level of fixed uh, fixed revenues. We're looking at some minority stakes in UK operational offshore wind and also some Nordic essential infrastructure assets. Uh, all of these transaction opportunities will keep contributing to our diversification strategy. Um, if we move on, uh, we have covered the performance of our fund during the course of 2021. Um, the very pleased to see the NAV has gone up by, by 5.8%. We've, we've reached 103.5 pence. This increase is predominantly due to the strong operational performance, but also the long term power price forecasts that have gone up. Um, if we look on the next slide, we have set out the the NAV and the return performance during during 2021 by, by quarter. So total return of 7.9% since IPO. And this includes a three and a half P dividend that we started to pay in the middle of the year. Um, on the next slide, we set out the general sensitivities to our valuations, um, relatively standard. Uh, didn't have in mind to, to take you through this in any particular detail. However, what I would like to point to is, is on your right on this slide here, uh, and that's our discount rate. The, the weighted average discount rate uh, for the assets in, in, in the fund is 7.3%. And that's a range um, of, of five and a half to seven and a half, and the five and a half uh, represent a few solar SPVs, which, which are ungeared. If we move on to the macroeconomic environment, so uh, what I want to cover in the, this section here is inflation, power prices, and interest rates. I think we have an overall positive story to tell here. On the first slide, um, we've set out the inflation here over the past 20 years. Currently, as you can see, and known to you, of course, before this call, is, is that the current inflation environment is very high and, and running at over 7%. Um, on the, the next slide, um, we've set out the, the overview of the UK forward power prices. And, and historically here, uh, the, the forward power prices for the UK has traded between uh, 30 pounds to, to 70 pounds per megawatt hour. Um, but during the second half of 2021, and of course into 2022 as well, the, the power prices have traded at significantly higher levels and reaching level, price levels over two and 300 pounds per, per megawatt hour. So, um, so power prices are, are at record high levels. Um, what does this mean for DOOR? Well, we tried to put that together on, on this slide here and we produced a, a chart uh, on the right hand side here. And this chart sets out the, the revenue composition for, for the fund. Um, the dark blue area at the bottom here of this chart that illustrates our fixed but inflation linked revenues. So over 50% of, of our revenues are, are linked to inflation. So the high inflation obviously means high, higher revenues for, for our fund. The dark green in the middle, that's, that's other fixed revenues. They aren't directly inflation linked, but um, uh, are expected to have some form of indirect link to, to inflation over time. But the turquoise revenues here, they are, they are merchants effectively, and they are benefiting from, from the high spot prices. And um, as you can see, that, that um, uh, merchant proportion increases over time. Um, moving on to, to the next slide, um, we can't really talk about inflation without talking about interest rates is, is the key monetary tool in response to, to inflation. Um, those current borrowings are fixed and they're fixed in the long term as well. We're not exposed to changes in interest rates in the UK or in Sweden until 2034. Um, so so that's, that's very positive for the fund. Uh, of course, future interest costs may change and, and that will be relevant for acquisitions we, we make in the future. 
but that will of course be known and reflected into any, any purchases we, we make in the future. As we also mentioned, uh, DOOR has a 25 million pound revolving credit facility at the fund level that is currently undrawn. Borrowings under this are intended to be short term. It's effectively bridge capital to fund acquisitions ahead of the capital raise. Um, the facility can be fixed as uh, have fixed interest as and when we, we use it. Um, moving on to the next slide, putting debt and inflation together. Well, what inflation does is it increases our cash available to, to service debt. Um, we do have a positive impact on the portfolio from high inflation. Revenues do increase more than, than costs do. Um, so whilst the high inflation, uh, inflation environment we have now is, is positive for, for uh, our portfolio, we are of course cognizant this may not last for the, for, for the full economic life of these assets. And we should point out that some of the debt we have is linked to inflation as well, and, and that can be helpful to mitigate returns in case we have a future environment of, of low inflation. And um, wrapping this up, um, we have uh, returning to the same slide as, as earlier, we have had a very strong deployment of capital over the last 12 months. We continue to see a very strong pipeline. Um, we've had a very encouraging start to, uh, to, to the portfolio in terms of operational and financial performance. The total return at 7.9% 7, 7 has exceeded our stated target. Um, and we are operating in a very favorable macroeconomic environment. And I think I'll, I'll stop there and um, uh, welcome any questions you may have for, for Tom and myself. Great, thanks, Henrik. So uh, if we get going, I think a um, couple of questions here about Sweden. So it's a, a why do you have such a big focus on Sweden? Um, was that always part of the plan? Or is that just where the opportunities arose? Well, it's, it's a combination of the two, right? So, so the part of the plan was, was UK and, and uh, Northern Europe. Um, so Northern Europe uh, with a focus on the Nordics. Um, so, so looking at the Nordics was always the, the strategy here. Um, I think the fact that we have wind and hydro both in Sweden is perhaps more of a, a coincidence and, and, and than exactly the stated set of strategy of just focusing on Sweden. We are we are looking across the, the Nordic region and, and Northern Europe. Um, and what's this kind of regulatory framework like in Sweden? Is it a bit like the UK one? Um, the, the regulatory framework in, in terms of, um, could, could you expand the question? <laughs> Which well, part I, I of regulation? guess we're thinking, um, firstly, do you get the same sort of subsidies that you might do in the UK? Um, and then secondly, in terms of the, the power price market, is it the same power price? No, no. So, so, so they're quite different, right? So, so the, the, all, all the renewable energy in the Nordics is it's pretty much without any subsidies. Um, there are a few smaller subsidies, but, but it's not material to, to the investments you make. Um, Hydro has been around and been profitable for you know hundred years, um, so, so it's an asset class that, that, that's well known and can, can operate without without any subsidies. Um, in terms of your um, power prices, uh, there is what is known as the Nordpool market. Um, the Nordpool market is very liquid for for hedging your power power price exposure. So um, that's the, the the main platform uh, that that you, that you lock in your, your future power prices through. Um, liquidity is higher in, in the short and the medium term than it is in the long term, but, but you can hedge out for, for up to 10 years and uh, through the Nordpool market. So, so where you've got exposure to uh, inflation uplifts, they're coming from the UK subsidies then? Is that, that where they're mainly coming from? That, that's right. Yes, if you're thinking about that chart we, should, we looked at earlier, yes, that, that's that's UK inflation linked. Yes, yes. Do you know what the split is between your subsidy revenue and the the revenue from your merchant power prices? Is, is that on that chart before uh, this one? 
Um, yes, I think that that is a good uh, indication. Tom, do you have the details more at hand? But I think that it gives you a pretty good good indication. Yeah, it was 50, I was at the 31st of December, it was 54% of the of the fund was directly linked to, to inflation. Um, obviously the the 46% difference is an element of fixed prices. They want to be fixed. You take away that inflation index, but we fix in the short term. Um, and merchant power prices form part of the basket of goods which form the RPI calculation. So there's this really strong correlation there as well between um, power prices and, and, and inflation. Okay, thanks. Do you have any battery storage exposure? And um, do you plan to add to that? We don't at um, the moment. It's within our mandate. I fully expect that we will um, look at certainly co-location of batteries over the over the longer term. Where we already benefit hugely from uh, storage is the the forty thousand Olympic swim pools that Henrik mentioned earlier. So part of the reason we've the the hydro assets have outperformed our our investment case this year is um, we are essentially able to store months uh, and weeks and months of generation. And release that when you see longer periods of power power prices. So, in a, a, a typical battery in the UK, that will be able to generate sorry, not generate export for an hour, maybe two hours, and you're and you're relying on volatility in the intraday market there to to, to trade that to trade those assets. And the storage capacity we have in 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 Sweden allows us to benefit from sustained long periods of power prices and also hold back water and generation when we see power prices dipping. Um, so we are really happy with how we can benefit from storage, but it's just not through the typical batteries that you would um, that you see within the UK. There's a question here asking, how dependent are you on rainfall patterns uh, with the hydro stuff? Yeah, without water, it's, it's obviously hard to produce uh, hydro. So, so it's um, it's important that it rains. Um, but but uh, I think you know, just like solar and wind, you, you have yes with, with good generation and, and and yes with bad generation. So uh, which comes back to that diversification we, we, we talked about earlier. But well, what is important with rainfall is to differentiate between. Um, hydropower plants with storage capacity and hydropower plants that are, are pure run a river. Um, so most of our portfolio is um, is with storage, uh, and I think for, for here we're mentioning on this slide I have now it's it's uh, we're quite for run a river hydropower plants. They are run a river from our perspective in, in the sense that we don't control any uh, storage ourselves. However, further upstreams there are other hydropower plant owners with significant storage. Um, and they will, of, of course, operate that in a way that is perhaps um, optimizing their own revenues, but it, that's a pretty good link to how that will, will then flow through the river system and, and down to, uh, to our hydropower plants as well. So yes, of course, it needs to rain. Otherwise, um, we, don't, uh, we don't produce um, in, in the long term. However, if you do look back in history, what happens uh, in, in a dry year? Well, power prices tend to go up quite a lot. Uh, and that's because the Nordic market is so dominated by, by hydro. So low hydro production due to low rainfall is positive for, for, um, for the spot prices in general. Can you get too much rain? Uh, you can get too much rain, yeah. <laughs> Your reservoirs will fill up too much, too, too much, and and, and uh, you will spill a lot. Uh, so, so that's what happens. You you can't uh, you, you can't process enough water uh, through your facilities, but uh, so so you, you would spill more than what, what you would like to. Okay, but you don't have to worry about sort of floods damaging plant and stuff. I mean, that, that of course can happen. Uh, you do have. Um, hasn't happened to, it's rare for it to happen you do have your your insurances in place but it's it's not uh, it's not something that's that, that it's it's common okay um you said the swedish market doesn't have subsidies um i suppose that's, that's understandable for the hydroelectric stuff why not for things like wind though um well th there is so there has been a system of, of electricity certificates um but they have had a very very low value 
and, and then probably not turn out the way that uh, was intended when, when it was introduced, what was it, 15 years ago, something like that. Um, I think the, the, the rationale comes back to the market forces. Uh, you've had a lot of wind constructed in, in the region without having to have um, any subsidies uh, required to do this. The, the actual wind profile, the generation is, is very strong. Uh, cost of land is, is less uh, than well, what you find in many other geographies in, in Europe. So it, it's effectively a market response. It hasn't been required in order to, uh, in order to construct a significant amount of renewable energy. Is the solar work in the Nordics or is it we too far north there? <laughs> It, it does work. Um, probably the more south you go, the better it is. Um, it's not a significant market as such. Uh, we do keep our eyes on it. Um, there you do have some subsidies uh, regimes for it to actually work, uh, but, but it's a very, very small market uh, as it is at the moment. Okay. Um, what about your discount rate? So how is, how is that set? Because obviously that that's, has quite a big impact on the NAV. Um, what, what sort of things influence that, that number? Yeah. Tom, do you want to take this? <laughs> Thanks, Henrik. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, um, we spend a lot of time uh, reviewing the, the discount rates. The main driver to where that is set is uh, we're essentially trying to value the portfolio on a, on a, on a free market price. So it's the, it's the transactions that we... Uh, that we see that we're involved with uh, and the market prices of those uh, that will set those discount rates. So um, I see there's a question on the board here about how that's linked to 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 uh, in rising interest rates. I don't, we we, we reconcile to a risk-free rate. Um, so if that risk-free rate is, is rising, I don't think you would necessarily see the market moving there. Their discount rates up as certainly as quickly. Henry covered briefly in the presentation earlier where our discount rate is sat. So that's 7.3 uh, way to value across the portfolio. Um, there is a cushion between us and, and the average across the peer group. Um, in that we are we are already slightly higher than the rest of the, the market. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily expect uh, that discount rate to increase even further as the as the base rate increases. Okay, that makes sense. And, and Shui, you've got things like five and a half would be things like UK solo, is that right? That's right. That's, that's, we've got one um, ungeared uh, ground mount solar in the in the UK. And the, the, it's worth saying as well, the top end of that range, which was a 7.5, um, is our geared, geared solar portfolio. Okay. Fair enough. So, the, so putting gearing into something means you need a higher discount rate? Yeah, that's right, and, and it's, it, we've, there's a lot of transparency in the numbers I've just given you in terms of you can see the the, the impact you can see on, on on gearing. Our solar portfolio um, has got a good level of, of gearing, um, but we've done the same on the hydro, so that's that's valued at a geared discount rate as well at seven point three percent. Okay, then if we talk about sales of power, so we had that chart with the the chunk of merchant power sales. Do you try and um, get long-term um, power purchase agreements um, to, to covering the, the output of your plants? Yes, so the, in the UK we have 10-year um, PPAs um, and you see the long tail on that chart, if you, if you remember, represents, I know there's a flaw mechanism within that, within that PPA which protects us from severe downsides, which is unusual but, but helpful. Um, um, within those, the UK PPAs, we can fix pricing for any season subject to market liquidity at any time. Um, so we, will, we, we have a strong level of experience in, in our team that monitors these markets on a, on a daily basis. And we have a linear reducing target of um, fixing high levels in the next year, reducing over three, four years um, down um in the in in the uk um in the in the swedish assets we have long-term ppas but it's a, a slightly different way of, of hedging the the power prices there it's a more liquid market in the north pool as, as henrik said so we're able to to go out a bit further than those assets um, but you you suffer you you pay quite a heavy price for uh liquidity after sort of years three four five um which is why you see that 
that fixed proportion in that chart tail off there because you're paying, um, in our opinion, too much for that for that certainty. Okay, fair enough. That makes sense. Um, how are you putting together the portfolio? Where, where are you getting the assets from? Do you, do you end up competing in auctions for things or are you buying them direct from the people that make them, build them? It's a combination of sources, uh, how, we, how we source the, 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 the transactions. We do, we do look at um, auctions. We, we, we have uh, participated in those. We, we um, obviously make sure that we, we only bid what we think a, an asset is worth. Uh, we have a pretty pretty significant network, um, both as an institution as a, and as individuals, for um, picking up uh, assets that, that don't go through the sort of formal auction systems as well. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's just a, a big network um, of of, uh, of contacts throughout throughout U UK, Northern Europe. I mean, obviously. It'd be great if this home was bigger. I mean, I hope you are going to grow it. But if you get more money in, uh, will it go in the same markets you're in at the moment, or are you going to keep diversifying it by country and um, type of project? Yeah, uh, on the assumption we do raise more capital, um, diversification will remain um, key to, key to that. Uh, we we like the assets we bought so far. We had a slide earlier here in the middle of the pack of, of pipeline assets and um, they will con contribute to further diversification uh, obviously depending on exactly how we spend the money um, but for example we, we, we mentioned we look at, at UK offshore wind minority stakes because of the size of, of our fund um, that is diversification uh, certainly diversification towards UK solar it also does diversification compared to, to, to Nordic wind given different wind patterns and also different uh, revenue markets for for um, between the UK and, and the Nordics. Um, so yeah, we, we do continue to, to, to focus on, on diversifying the fund. Uh, it's uh, it's something we think will be, be attractive in the, in the long term for investors. Okay. And are there any markets, uh, it's primarily, it's a really European fund, but are there any markets you wouldn't touch? Would you go to sort of like Spain or Italy, for example? Uh, the, the mandate is is UK and Northern Europe, so so um, um, so, so that's the that's that's the Nordic and, and yeah, here you go. I think we covered it there. <laughs> here, here you see the geographists. I think uh, probably should add Finland, Finland a bit more to this as well. Yeah. Okay. So so you you said on the previous slide I was showing you you got things in Poland that you look at Germany I guess that sort of area, um, but but definitely Northern Europe and that's. What was the reason for that? It's a risk level that is has a, a reasonable correlation between each other in these in these markets, um, and I think it also plays back to the strength of, of our organisation and, and the people within it that we actually do know these markets, we understand how they work. Um, so, so putting that together, that's the background to, to, to the rationale here of having a coherent risk level uh, and focusing on geographies that we actually know how, how they work. What's the attitude towards buying things when they're in the construction stage? Yes, so that is part of the mandate. Um, and we, we are looking at those types of, 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 um, of projects. Um, we probably not right now focusing on that in the sense that we want the fund to grow a bit more for that to be um, a better mix for, for us in, in terms of, of generating uh, operational cash flows, paying, paying the dividend side of the fund, uh, whilst also investing in, in uh, uh, construction assets. So, so we, we certainly see that going forward, something we will, will be continuing to look at and, and hopefully make investments in. Uh, as that will deliver that that uptick in uh, in returns compared to, to acquiring operational assets. Um, just think about the kind of big picture. Obviously, the whole UK energy policy is in a bit of a mess uh, with, with with what's happening with um, gas. Um, do you see that there's any kind of policy change likely 
uh, across Europe in response to this? I mean, I think one of the things I've seen is that, that people expect to see much more investment in renewable energy generally. Is that something you, you, you'd echo? Yeah, I, I think that I think that's fair, right? Um, it is most likely going to accelerate the investments into to renewable energy. What's what's going on now? Um, I think it's also fair to say that it's uh, a lot of intermittent gen uh, energy that's being being added. So you need to to deal with the peaks and troughs. So you, you talked about battery earlier on. Um, I think our answer still remains with that. Uh, Hydra is uh, is an excellent battery um, and, and works really well uh, in the markets where, where, where you have a significant Hydra, um, which is which is one of the reasons why, why we really do like the Hydra. We think the, the sort of long-term value of Hydra and the storage it provides, um, but we'll just, that, that value would just go up and up and up. Um, Based on what we know today, of course, the future may may change, but but it is something that is, is incredible, incredibly valuable. Do you think that higher power prices are here to stay, or are they a temporary thing? <laughs> oh, that's a good question, right? If I knew this, I'd probably <laughs> I'd probably retired by now. Um, but um, yeah, I I think you know you you just look generally uh, as to what. What the consultants are saying and, and, and how the, the markets have moved in, in terms of hedging future power prices. And there's certainly been an uptick over the last year or so, uh, even before the um, even before the, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So I think the signs are there for, for higher power prices to stay. But um, and that's that's probably what the consultants would, would, would tell you. But um, yeah, I, I think we're getting into too much speculation. What, what kind of power price are you, you um, forecasting in, in your NEV for the for the UK? So we we use uh, a, a simple average of two consultants curves um, that um, over the next 25, 30 years. Uh, I don't have actually what that, that, that long term trend is, is that where we are fixing prices in the near term, but it also fall, falls into our into our model. So we are fixing electricity right now for summer 23 at above at above 100 pounds um, wow. and that distribution chart that um, appears somewhere in this in this slide pack in, just in terms of the where that market has been over the last six months is it is absolutely incredible like you, you would have fixed it you'd have taken 50 and be happy with it um nine months ago um and that this is the, this chart is a distribution chart so it does take a bit of getting your head around but that axis uh, that x-axis has just been added to on, uh, further to the right on a on a weekly basis um um so yeah we are we do fix um we're a yielding fund and we're there to protect that yield uh, as henry said we don't we're not able to we don't want to speculate on power prices but when we see the value we are seeing yeah, we do we do lock that in where we can fair enough um in terms of the kind of capital structure um you, you talked about um, you had some gearing on the solar and you um, took some gearing on the um, hydro, is that right? So are, is that kind of balance between debt and equity about right now or is there more to do? Yeah, so suppose the drawdowns, I think we've communicated, we're about just under 40% levered uh, after that drawdown from downing hydro. Um, so what's our long-term level, it's probably at or, or slightly higher than that. So say between 40, 45% is probably what, what, what you'd look at. Of course, this all depends on um, which asset you buy and, and um, how much leverage each, each asset can sustain. Um, actually, I think because, because of that chart in Northern Ireland, the solar that you've got, is it utility scale solar or, or is it rooftop? It's a real mix. Um, so one of the things, the, the market spends a lot of time talking about sort of economies of scale and, and large solar solar assets, which have their advantages, but certainly when you're buying in the secondary market, um, you want that diversity, diversity of geography and that diversity of risk against single point of failures. So we have a um, about a dozen utility scale ground mount assets. Um, we have uh, a portfolio of commercial rooftop assets. 
uh, and in Northern Ireland specifically, residential, so about 3,000 residential systems. Um, so, um, yeah, real mix, including utility scale solar. Cool. Okay, great. Um, one more kind of ESG point that's come up a couple of times when we've been talking to renewable energy fans. Do you, do you actually look at where the supply chain, where, where you buying things like solar panels from? Yes, we do. Um, so from, uh, well, all our equipment and, 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 and spare parts. So we look at this from two aspects. We have, um, wasn't the question, but we do look at this from a carbon life cycle um, uh, analysis perspective. So when we're buying wind blades or, or panels, shipping them from, from China or Germany does make a difference in terms of the sustainability impact of these assets. So for example, the, the energy mix in China is, is heavily based on coal and you're transporting them a long way. So it, it reduces the sustain of the, the carbon impact of the asset. The question is more focused on um, questions around modern slavery and um, sourcing those panels of China. So we're completely aligned here with the Solar Trade Association. We do make sure that uh, the procurement policies that we that we put in place and the parties we work with uh, are completely aligned with, with that. And we actually go a level below the module manufacturers as well uh, and look to take reassurance that the raw materials have come from um, from camps, from areas and, and supply chains we're happy to work with. Um, one last one here. Have you uh, got the opportunity to buy any hydro in Scotland? It's part of our mandate uh, and it's something we, we, we've looked at. The the, the UK hydro market is, of course, smaller than, than the Nordic one. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's part of our mandate. And, and if we find the right opportunity, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly act on it. Great. OK. I think we've, we've covered a lot of ground here now. We're running out of time. So I think we'll wrap it up if that's OK. But thank you very much for your time this morning. Um, I'm sure there was a context page there if um, anybody needs to get hold of you and ask any more questions. Um, but um, thanks for this morning, and um, we'll be writing a note on you fairly soon, I think. So um, we'll update our readers on what's going on. But thank you. Okay. So thanks, everyone. Uh, all good. Thank you. Um, this is what we have lined up now. So uh, tomorrow we'll be at Master Investor. Uh, as I've been training for a while now. I, I think you can still get tickets through us um, um, on the website, if you have to look at the events page on the website. Um, next week, we'll be talking to uh, Blake Hutchins of Troy Income and Growth, completing the sort of triumvirate of um, Troy funds that we've been looking at recently. And then we've got Temple Bar talking to us on the 1st. We've got, I think, somebody lined up for the 8th now. Then it's obviously Good Friday. Um, we'll be back the week after talking to Aberdeen Latin American Income Fund. So um, thanks for all of this. If you are coming tomorrow, I'll look um, forward to seeing you there. Otherwise, we'll catch up again next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.